Hello everyone and welcome to the chapter two lecture for microbiology. This chapter is all about growing bacteria in the lab and looking at it under the microscope and staining it basically. So the first thing is how to culture bacteria. So you know up until you took microbiology culture was probably a term that you associated with like different ethnicities or like you know someone drinking tea okay but now you're gonna associate it with microbes so in microbiology a culture is a um like a plate or a tube or something that is growing microbes bacteria fungi viruses even so the five eyes of culturing microbes are inoculation incubation isolation inspection and identification so we're going to go through each of these but this is sort of like your cheat sheet summary slide all right so the first step is inoculation inoculation is the term that we use when you add um, bacteria to sterile culture so um, we do this in the lab if we are trying to you know take a sample and grow it uh, so we take sterile media and we inoculate it with a specific bacteria that we want to grow um, when you're sampling in a clinical setting and you're taking a you know covid swab and you're getting a intranasal swab or you are swabbing a wound that's potentially infected um, and then you are putting that tube or that that swab into a tube of media that is sterile until you inoculate it so inoculation is introducing microbes into a growth medium and a medium in this case is just a substance so in art you might use the word media something like that so in art you talk about media as being like do you use paint or charcoal or digital you know computer stuff so we're not talking about like media like the news so culture media is just the growth material um so the inoculum can be either like from a petri dish of known bacteria if you're researching in the lab in a clinical setting the inoculum is usually from a patient sample and there's all kinds of body fluids and body sites that can be sampled um, and culture medium can be solid like auger in a petri dish it can be liquid like a liquid broth in a tube um, or it could be a living thing so um, eggs are a classic example viruses flu virus for the, making the vaccine the flu vaccine is grown in eggs um, but also sometimes we need cell culture viruses depend on cells to live so they might be grown in cell culture or even in animals themselves I used to in grad school I worked on a parasite um, that you can't grow in culture you have to grow it in mice so we would infect mice um, with the larva stage and then we would harvest the adult stage of the worm from the mice all right so some uh, these growth media can come in different flavors if you will there are different states so there's solid versus liquid so agar is a classic type of solid media agar by the way is the ingredient it's like a gelatin like ingredient and so in the u.s like we make jello out of gelatin which i think i think is something like ground up pig's hooves i think it is actually derived from bone material and but agar is a similar gelatinous material that's derived from seaweed and in some countries um jello is actually made with agar so it's vegetarian um, if you ever get vegan uh, jello, it contains agar, and sometimes it's just called agar agar instead of jello. Anyway, those are fun facts for you. So it's it's just the gelatinous substance that keeps makes it gives it that jello consistency. So it's it's solid, but it's not you know solid. Um, then there's something called semi-solid media, which is like kind of like runny agar, runny jello. So it's like thick, like you know, like a milkshake is thick but it's viscous so it's, it's very viscous liquid let's put it like that um 
You can also have differences in the chemical makeup, sort of the recipe of the media. So TSA is a very standard media. It stands for triptych soy agar. It's basically like chicken broth for bacteria. I mean, it, it essentially is chicken broth. It's just water with a bunch of salts and sugars and vitamins and minerals that are in there that bacteria need to grow. Um, and so it's pretty, pretty basic, pretty general, like chicken broth is very bland, right? But some bacteria, and some bacteria, that's all they need. But some bacteria are what we call fastidious, meaning they have sort of extra needs. And so they might need extra ingredients. So there's different types of agar that have, that we say that they're enriched with extra ingredients like blood agar. Uh, sorry, I should turn that off. That's gonna annoy me. Let's exit out of my email. There we go. Ugh, I'm just gonna start over. Hi everyone, and welcome to the chapter two lecture for microbiology. In this chapter, we're going to be talking about growing bacteria in the lab and looking at it under the microscope. So when we grow bacteria in the lab, we say that we are culturing the bacteria. So culture in microbiology does not mean like what ethnicity or nationality you are from and the traditions you have. That is a different definition of culture. So in this class, when we say culture, we're talking about growing microbes um, in a dish or in a tube or in an animal. For, so there's lots of different, there's, there's five different steps to culturing microbes and they all begin with I. So the textbook has this cute little, the five eyes of culturing microbes. So the first thing we do is inoculate. That's when we add uh, microbes to our culture media. Then we have to incubate it, let them grow and proliferate. Then um, hopefully we get isolated colonies that we can then examine or inspect under a microscope or with different biochemical tests. And that will allow us to identify the bacteria or, or fungus or whatever the microbe is. So let's first talk about inoculation. So inoculation is the process of introducing bacteria to a growth media or fungi or viruses. So it's adding a microbe to a growth media. It's important to use aseptic technique when you are inoculating because you only want to grow what you want to grow. So if you're in a lab and you're trying to grow a culture of Bacillus cereus, right? You wanna make sure that you don't contaminate that culture with bacteria from your mouth or your hands or the environment. You want it to be a pure culture of just that one bacteria you intend to grow. Same thing if you're sampling a patient, right? If you're sampling a wound on their hand, right? You wanna make sure you're getting the bacteria from the wound, not bacteria from the hand. And the hand is covered, the whole body's covered in normal flora. We wanna avoid sampling those and just sampling the site that we wanna sample. So sterile sampling technique is important. It's important not to contaminate your culture because if you're trying to identify a bacteria, you don't want other confounding bacteria floating around in there. But also in the case of healthcare, if you're sampling someone's wound, you also don't want to introduce bacteria into that wound. So it's important from both ends. You don't want to infect um, the per and same thing when you're if you're working in a lab with that culture of Bacillus cereus, you don't want to get your own bacteria in there, but you also don't want to get Bacillus cereus into yourself because it causes food poisoning and it's not pleasant. So aseptic technique is both to protect you and to protect your science and your culture. Um, so lots of different things or body fluids, I guess I could say, can serve as inoculum in a clinical setting. So a wound, urine sample, stool sample, sputum sample, intranasal swab, throat swab, those are all um, inoculum. And you, then you take that swab and you swirl it around in a little tube of sterile media and you inoculate that media, send it to the lab and they do stuff with it. 
So there's different types of culture media. Media is plural, medium is singular. And again, in this is a term that has a different meaning than so medium, usually think, you know, small, medium, large. But in this case, we're talking about medium as a substance. So you see this in art too. People talk about what, oh, what medium do you dabble in? You know, is it pastels or oils or charcoal? So um, it's just sort of like a form, I guess, is the, sort of like a definition. So in this case, culture medium, is a just whatever material it is you're using to grow your bacteria. So the culture media is basically bacteria food or fungus food or viral food. I, I default to bacteria, but really we're, ta we're talking about microbes, um, which there's lots of kinds. Okay, so you could have some common types of culture media include auger plates, so a Petri dish with auger in it, which is kind of like a jello. Um, you can have liquid culture, so broth culture, which is in a tube, or in this case, a blood culture. You can also have cell culture, which is actually usually in a tube like this, looks kind of like this, but there's actually cells in there. And um, that's definitely needed for viruses. Viruses cannot grow in just media. They have to have cells to infect. So, um, but the cells require growth media. Food to grow in. Sometimes the growth medium is an actual animal or an organism. Um, eggs are used to grow flu virus to generate flu vaccines. So flu vaccines actually are a huge contributor or user of the egg industry. Um, if there's egg shortages from chickens, uh, we have trouble making flu virus for vaccines. Um, another example is parasites. A lot of parasites can't be grown in culture. I used to work in, in grad school. I worked with a, a helminth, a parasitic worm, that we had to grow in mice. So we'd infect the mice with the larval stage and it would mature into adult worms and then we'd harvest the adult worms from the mice. We couldn't grow the worms in culture. All right, so cultures come in, I guess you could say they, they are like, culture media is basically food for microbes. And so just like we have lots of different types of food, different flavors, different you know food groups, we can kind of say the same thing for microbes. Okay, so there are differences in the physical state of the growth media. You can have liquid growth media like broth. Um, you can have solid media like um, agar. So agar is actually just like a, gel a gelatinous material substance, like gelatin, when you make jello. Um, so in the US, most gelatin, jello and marshmallows are made from gelatin, which is derived from pig hooves or bone. And so it's not vegan friendly, but in a lot of countries they use agar instead, or agar agar, which is a, gelatinous substances derived from kelp from seaweed so if you ever get like vegan jello or vegan marshmallows you're getting ones that have agar rather than gelatin but they're otherwise you know tasteless substances that cause things to form a gel um, so the reason we use it in growth media is to make it that salt to solidify it you know it's not solid solid it's like jello solid so it's jiggly um, but it has a surface that things can grow on. And things grow differently in broth versus culture. So in a broth, the bacteria growing in the broth would just make the broth kind of cloudy. You might see maybe some little clumps of clouds, but you're not going to be able to see to separate the bacteria anyway. They're all kind of floating around in the broth, right? But when you plate bacteria when you swab them spread them on a plate um, if you end up with a single bacteria isolated by itself it will grow and replicate in that same spot and you end up with a colony so you can kind of see where individual bacteria landed on a plate and you can grow up individual bacteria on a plate and so if you have different types like a mixture of bacteria you can get them separated by swapping them out on a plate, whereas you can't do that in a broth. So there are reasons for using one 
versus the other. Um, in broth, if, if you just want to grow up a whole bunch of microbes of the same kind, broth is a great way to do that. So when it comes to different types of broths, different types of the actual um, uh, recipes, if you will, for these different types of growth media, there are general media, which are also called defined. So a divine, defined or general media is one that kind of has the consistency and recipe of chicken broth. It's bland. It's usually the same color as chicken broth. It's basically just water with salts and amino acids and some sugars and some vitamins and minerals thrown in there. All the things that bacteria, most bacteria need to grow. But some bacteria or fungi are very particular. They're very picky. They have some um, extra nutritional needs. And so you have to add extra ingredients in order to grow them. So there's also lots of types of complex or enriched media. And these are media that have extra things added to them. So blood auger is a classic example of an enriched media. It's um, so defined media is one where you know the exact recipe to make it as in you know every single salt sugar amino acid that's in you know you can define all of the chemicals um, that are in it in a complex media there are ingredients that can't be defined so for example blood if you put blood in the media you 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 can't say what exactly the components the chemical components of the blood are and they might vary from batch to batch ever so slightly um, but so there's technically it's it's not defined you can't you can't list out all the ingredients you just list blood as the ingredient i kind of compare them to like um uh, when you feed babies formula versus breast milk so formula is defined it is an exact recipe we know exactly what the components of formula are whereas breast milk is complex it's made based on you know what you're eating in your diet what your body chemistry is how much the baby feeds so there's lots of things that can vary um, in breast milk from one person to another or even in the same person from you know one week to another so we mostly know what it's made of but we can't exactly define it so that's the difference between defined and complex media um, all right so media is food for bacteria but we can also manipulate it to help us identify bacteria or grow them um, only certain bacteria that we want to grow and so a lot of times we will use media that is either selective or differential or both selective and differential so the benefits of a selective media um, in a selective media you have some ingredient that inhibits the growth of undesirable bacteria depending on, you know, there's lots of different types of selective media. So one example, one that I often do in lab is um, MSA, mannitol salt auger. So bacteria don't like to, in general, they don't really like a really salty environment. Salt essentially dehydrates them. But there are some bacteria that have adapted to grow in salty environments and so they can handle it and they grow fine on that salty auger. So um, this sample here, if you have a mixed sample of bacteria and you want to grow the ones that are salt tolerant only, all right, if you put them on general purpose media, well, everything in that mixture would grow. And a lot of bacterial colonies look the same. So you wouldn't really be able to stand, they'd all just look like, you know, white, little white, uh, glossy things here. But if you grow them on media that has a higher salt content, the ones that can't handle the salt won't grow, and the ones that can will. And so you will select for those salt tolerant microbes. And it helps you just kind of weed out um, the microbes you don't care about that you that you don't want to grow from that mixture um, 
Another type of media is one that is differential. So like I said, if you take that mixture and you plate it on the general purpose media, a bunch of different types of bacteria will grow, but they look, they'll often look the same. The colonies look very much the same. You can't really distinguish which is which type of bacteria. But sometimes some of the bacteria will produce a certain enzyme or be able to digest a certain sugar that the others can't. And you can distinguish it by adding a that sugar to the media along with a dye, a pH dye, so that when the bacteria ferments the sugar, it changes the pH, which causes the dye to change colors. So differential media um, allows everything to grow still, but it makes the different bacteria appear different visually, usually a color change. So in this case, we're still growing multiple different types of bacteria, but now we can distinguish them visually because one's purple, one's red, and one's white. So a lot of times you'll have media that's both selective and differential. So it'll only grow salt tolerant microbes, but the different salt tolerant microbes will show up as different colors. And this is really helpful because it allow, allows us to, if we already have an idea maybe of a bacteria that we're looking for or trying to grow, um, then we can, we can isolate it from a mixture um, pretty simple in one step doing this type of, using these types of growth media. Um, other types of media that we can use to kind of do assays at the same time that we're growing the bacteria. You can use reducing media. So reducing media helps you grow anaerobic microbes that are basically allergic to oxygen. Um, so it's it includes a substance that basically sops up oxygen. So you don't have to Another, another option is to grow it in like an oxygen free chamber, which not everybody has. So the reducing media is sort of a, a cheat way to rob the media of oxygen so you can grow anaerobes. Um, there's carbohydrate fermentation media, which is pictured here. So different microbes can metabolize different carbohydrates, different sugars. And one of the pathways that bacteria have is they can ferment sugar and turn it into acid. And there's lots of different pH indicators, dyes, that change color if it's acidic or basic. And so um, this one contains a dye. This is the control, and it's usually like a, an orangish color. And um, if it's a if the media becomes basic because um, it's growing bacteria that produces a base somehow all right then it would turn like a magenta color and if it produces acid it turns a bright yellow color and so you can see the um, acid production just in the color change um, there's also different assay media there's um, a lot of what one common type of selective media is media that contains antibiotics so you could um, look for bacteria that are resistant to certain antibiotics by adding that antibiotic to the media. So once you have added your bacteria to the media, okay, this is not what it looks like. All right, the when you first swab the plate, it just maybe looks a little bit wet. You can maybe see the streak marks, but you don't actually see any bacteria on there because they're so tiny. They really need to grow. They need to grow to like millions of cells before you can actually see them on the plate. So in order to let them grow, we incubate them. We put them in a chamber at their optimal temperature, their ideal growth temperature. So in a clinical setting, incubators are usually set to 37 degrees Celsius, which is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, which is normal body temperature, because usually we're trying to grow microbes that live on the body. And so body temperature is their optimal growth temperature. Um, some bacteria are cold adapted and they may need to be grown at the cold. Most bacteria can still grow at room temperature, even um, if you just leave them out at room temperature or if the incubator is just set to room temperature. 
So incubator temperature can vary. That's not a set temperature. It's whatever temperature is best to grow the microbes you're trying to grow. And it usually takes, takes a little while before they are at numbers that you can visualize. So a typical incubation period is something around 24 hours, maybe 48 hours. But there are some bacteria that grow really fast and you could probably see them after 12 hours. And then there are others that grow really slow or have really small colonies and you need to go beyond 48 hours or even weeks depending, depending on the bacteria or fungus or whatever it is. Another thing that might be controlled inside the incubator environment is gases like oxygen and carbon dioxide levels. Um, to optimize growth as well. So it's basically just a safe, a safe warm box to put your bacteria in. Um, before they had incubators, like a, a lot of scientists in, originally just grew them like, you know, on their bench top and still do um, if they don't need to be at a certain temperature. Uh, but it's a uh, more, a little more safe and sterile to put them in a designated area to grow. All right. So after the bacteria have grown on your petri dish or in your culture tube, um, you want to be able to separate them, distinguish them, be able to identify what those bacteria are. So if it's a mixed culture and whenever you're getting a sample from a patient, you always have to assume it's a mix. There's going to be a mixture of bacteria in there. And so you want to be able to isolate the different types of bacteria that might grow. And so there are mechanisms for doing this. If you have taken a swab and you've inoculated a culture tube, all right, you can swab these out on a plate and spread them apart so much that individual bacteria land on individual spots on the plate. Now you can't see that, but after you incubate it and you see individual colonies popping up, an individual colony, all right, as you can see in the live picture here, is indicative of a place where a single bacteria landed and then multiplied. So this, this colony right here is actually just a bunch of clones, like millions of clones of a single bacteria that then just kept dividing and copying itself and copying itself and growing on top and just forming this little mountain of bacteria that we can now see. Okay, so um, and you can see in this picture, there are some that some colonies that are growing red with red pigment and some that are white. And so those the difference, the phenotypic differences, the visual differences there tell us that they are different bacteria. So we can tell there's at least two different types of bacteria. So there's several different isolation techniques, techniques for for basically spreading bacteria so thinly that you do get individual bacteria in their own spot on the plate. Because again, they're invisible. You can't see if you're spreading them out um, or not when you're doing it live. You just are kind of hoping you are. So there's three different techniques that are used. The one that we use in lab the most is the streak plate technique. So for a streak plate, what you do is you take an auger plate and all right, here's this is going to be my my swab or my inoculation loop and hmm, what I want to use for a petri dish whatever I'll use this thing I don't know what this is like a stopper okay so you would get your sample um, and you would swab it just on one section of the plate maybe like a quarter of the plate then you would clean off your loop. You'd sterilize it in a flame or in alcohol. And you'd come back to your plate and you'd grab a little bit. You'd touch the spot that you'd already swabbed and you'd spread it into a new area. And then you would do the same thing. You'd, you'd clean off your, your loop and you would grab a little bit of that part that you just spread and you'd spread it into a new area. So what you're doing is you're basically diluting it as you go across. You're, you're sampling a little bit less and less and you're just trying to spread it out thinner and thinner. And then so 
at the end, after you've incubated it, you'll see in that first section, everything's really dense. You can't really see individual colonies. They're just kind of like all growing on top of each other, right? And then they spread out, get thinner and thinner. And then in this last area down here, you finally have gotten some individual colonies. You spread them out thin enough that you had individual cells far enough apart that they could grow into distinct colonies. That's a very classic way to do it. Um, other ways to do it, you can do something called a loop dilution, where you, um, so where you would take the culture tube, and you, so you'd have a tube of of agar, and you would put your sample in it and spread it around, and then you'd sterilize your loop, and then you'd go back in, you'd get a little bit of that sample and put it in a new tube, and swirl that around. So now that tube ha has a diluted amount. You sterilize your loop, go back in, get a little bit of that sample, put it in a third tube. And so basically you're doing what are called serial dilutions. And so you're inoculating all of that agar and then you pour it out. So you do it while it's still melted and then you pour it onto the plate. And so you get these dilution so each plate is growing fewer and fewer colonies and the ones that grow a lot of colonies they're growing kind of really connected together and too densely but as you get more and more dilute you start getting individual colonies and then another way to do it is uh, called a spread plate where you again do something like this where you make dilutions of broth and then you just put you just put like a few drops of that broth on the agar and spread it around so you have multiple plates so for loop dilution and spread plate for those a single um, you take a single sample and you end up spreading it out on multiple plates you're plating different dilutions on multiple plates so it requires it uses more media Whereas in a streak plate, you can on one single plate um, spread out the bacteria to look for individual colonies. So you end up with one plate. So it's a little bit more economical and it's quicker. All right, so now that you have this plate that has three different types of bacterial colonies growing on it, you want to identify what those bacteria are because you can't tell from looking at a colony most of the times. Many bacterial colonies look alike. It's um, looking at them on the microscopic level that we can see more and get more information in order to, ah, sorry, to identify them. So we can inspect them under a microscope. That's a classic way to do it. Put them on a slide and look. Um, another way we can do inspection is we can do biochemical tests to, so to look at like what sugars they ferment. There's immunological tests that we can do using antibodies and there's genetic testing that we can do to help identify what the, what the, the microbe is. And so usually the first, the, the cheapest, quickest, but also least informative step is inspection looking at at it under a microscope so that can give us some initial um, clues like um, oh it's rod shaped versus spherically shaped that can help us narrow it down but we oftentimes can't get a specific answer unless we do additional testing so let's talk about microscopy and the different forms of microscopy so um, there are things we can see without a microscope but our eyes have a limit to um, how clearly and how small they can see. So we can see things as small as, so frog eggs, if you've ever seen frog eggs like in a lake, they're small, they're like little like, you know, like sesame seed size. Um, a human egg cell is actually just barely visible by the naked eye. They're really, really tiny to our eyes, but they're actually huge in the as, as far as cells go. There's no other cell that you could possibly see with the naked eye. Um, but uh, and maybe I'm fudging that. Maybe human egg cells are still way too small, but, they're, but they are large for as far as cells go. Um, so you could see it obviously much better with a light microscope. So a light microscope is 
what you think of when you think of like, you know, a science lab and a microscope that you're looking at, that's a compound light microscope. And that's what we're going to talk about and show you how to use um, on the computer screen here. The a light microscope can see things as small as bacteria, so it can see eukaryotic cells like human cells, but also fungal cells. It can see bacterial cells too, um, but a lot of bacteria, some bacteria are very small, so you can't see them that clearly. Um, you still just see them as tiny little dots, even on high magnification. So you definitely can't see much detail on those bacterial surfaces. This bacteria here is pictured with all these, um, the flagella and these fimbriae, these little hairs sticking off of it. Okay, it's really difficult. You, you can, with certain staining, very faintly see flagella with a light microscope, but um, you would not see that much detail of a, a bacteria with a light microscope. You'd have to get higher resolution and use something like an electron microscope. So electron microscopy is um, super expensive. An electron microscope is something like, I don't know, half million to a million dollars. And we don't have an electron microscope at North Country Community College, only like research labs, research institutes have them. Um, but you can see things very small with an electron microscope. You can see um, proteins, you can see um, individual cell surfaces, like you can see the cell membrane and things that are embedded in it. So you can see a lot more detail with an electron microscope. But we're gonna focus on light microscopy. So this is a compound light microscope. Um, and these are the different pieces. So this, these two parts right here are the ocular eyepieces. That's the lens that you look into. All right, and light is generated down here actually by a bulb inside the base that shines up through this part here. It shines up all the way through this condenser lens. Um, this is where your sample would be on the stage. So it would shine through the sample and up through this objective lens. And it goes up here, bounces off a couple of mirrors and comes out into your eye. All right, so there's a couple of lenses here. There's the ocular lens which usually has a little bit of magnification, maybe 10 times magnification. And then there's these um, objective lenses. And there's usually four objective lenses on the standard compound microscope, um, sometimes three, like I have one at home and it, it has three on it. The fourth one usually requires oil. And so we, we, the home microscopes oftentimes don't come with those. Um, so they have different levels of magnification. Four times, 10 times, and 100 times are the standard magnification levels. Um, this piece right here spins, allows you to change objectives. And so that's called the nose piece or the spinning or rotating nose piece. Um, this platform here where you put your slide, your microscope slide, is called the stage. And the stage is movable and you can move it using these turn dials over here called the stage adjustment knobs that moves it front and back and moves it side to side. You also can adjust the resolution of the image. You can move the stage up and down. And the control that does that is this, the focus knob. So the coarse focus and fine focus move it closer or farther away until it's in the right focal plane. Kind of like when your kid, you know, says, look at this, look at this thing on my phone and they put it right up to your face and you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And um, that's me because I'm old. So I have to like hold it away from my face a little bit. If something's too close to your face, you can't see it. You got to get it. If it's too far away, you can't see it. So same thing with your microscope sample. It needs to be just the right distance for you to have the right focus, be in the right focal, focal plane. Um, what else? Under here is something called the aperture diaphragm. And this is, it's like a lens, it's a, it's an aperture. So it like opens and closes and it controls how much light goes in. So sometimes um, there's two ways to control the light here. So you can control it using the aperture by opening and closing this little um, 
hole. Or you can do it by adjusting the light. So a, a gun microscope will have this rheostat right here, which is a, you can adjust the light intensity. It's like a dial, like a dimmer switch. Um, the cheap at-home microscopes, like the one I have, it does not have a dimmer switch. So it's just the light is on or it's off. There's no controlling. I don't even think it has. I don't think it doesn't have a, an, af, uh, an aperture diaphragm either. It just has the stage and the light bulb. And then there's the on off switch. All right, so like I said, the light microscope works by there's a bulb in the base that shines light up through the aperture, through the sample, your microscope slide, and up through the objective lens, and then bounces off a couple of mirrors and comes out of the ocular lens. So because the light is getting bounced off mirrors, the image you see is actually inverted. So it's actually the opposite. So the real image has the um, pink rod on the left and the purple sphere on the right. Well, what you see in the microscope is the opposite of that. Kind of like when you look in a mirror and you see the opposite image. So it can be disorienting because if you're trying to scan on your microscope slide, you have to move the state when you move the stage left, the visual image is moving right. So um, sometimes that I that always gets me. I, I always get um, disoriented when moving around a slide. So the microscope does a few things for us, allows us to see tiny things um, because it magnifies it, it makes it bigger. Okay, but a, a good a light a microscope is not going to do you any good if it just makes things bigger. Um, think of like a poor quality image on your computer and trying to blow it up. All right, and then it's just like really pixelated, and so it's big, but it's not clear. It's actually blurrier because of trying to ex expand it. So for a microscope to be of good quality, it needs to not just be able to magnify things, but also to have good clear resolution. So you want it to be clear and not blurry. Or in other words, resolution is actually the ability to distinguish things clearly from one another. So this would be a sort of poor resolution and this is much better resolution. Um, you also need to have contrast and a good microscope will be able to provide that by adjusting the lighting, the angle of the light can provide contrast. So a lot of times when you're looking at like bacteria are oftentimes kind of transparent. They're the same kind of color as the glass slide they're on. And so in this image here, it's really hard to see this cell because it's the same color. It's kind of blending in with the surroundings. But simply by adjusting the lighting, the angle of the lighting, you can get more contrast between the cell and the background and be able to distinguish it more easily. So let's talk a little bit more about magnification. The microscope magnifies things, makes them bigger, using two sets of lenses. The ocular lens, which is the one you look through with your eye, oculo, and it usually has a 10x magnification. And then there's the objective lens, and there's various objective lenses. And the total magnification is just the magnification of the objective, plus the ocular lens, or sorry, times the ocular lens. So if you are looking through the 10x objective, then your total magnification would be 10 times 10, which is 100. So in other words, the image you're seeing is 100 times magnified. It's 100 times bigger than reality. And so that also, understand knowing that helps scientists determine the size of the things that they're looking at under the microscope, knowing the magnification. Um, <clears throat> resolution is important and the way that microscopes, um, one of the ways that microscopes can have better resolution is by using shorter wavelengths of light. So the way that this works is if you look at the wavelengths of different colors of light, red light has a longer wavelength than green light, which has a longer wavelength than blue light. Blue light has the shortest wavelength. And the shorter the wavelength, you kind of think of it as like the smaller the spaces it can fit through and the better it can resolve. So I stole this analogy from 
a colleague a few years ago. So if you imagine these balls representing light of different wavelengths. So the large ball, the basketball represents a large wavelength like the red and these little blue pellets, okay, represent something like blue wavelengths. So when you shoot large, if you're trying to, you know, get an image of this E using the balls, like imagine paint on the balls and there's a wall behind that E and you're just like, you know, throwing paint covered balls at it and you get these splotches and you get this outline. Okay, if you're using large wavelength or large balls, it's not going to be able to fit through those small, the smaller spaces, and you don't get a very clear image. This doesn't even look like an E, right? Um, but the smaller ball you use, the clearer the outline is, and um, the better, so the better the resolution is. So the same thing with wavelength, the smaller the wavelength of the light, the better and clearer the resolution is. So when we use red light and we look at this image, it kind of just looks like a single white, you know, um, cell or light or something right there in the center. But as we reduce the wavelength of light, we can see it when we use the blue light, we can see, no, it's actually two dots that are very close together. You can see there's actually a cleavage line. There's a separation there. So we can see it more clearly. Um, so resolutions, a, usually good resolution is what makes the microscope expensive. That's the feature that's the, the hardest to perfect. Contrast is the ability, again, to sort of kind of distinguish two things of similar color and refractive index from each other. So a refractive index is the degree to which something bends light. And cells generally have the same refractive index as glass. And so they're oftentimes very hard to see by themselves. These are sperm cells. And so um, under bright field, normal light microscopy, you look here and it's really difficult to see them. They're really camouflaged into the background there. All right, but by simply adjusting the angle of light on them, you can get them to sort of cast a shadow, if you will, that makes them pop out more from the background. Um, DIC, differential interference contrast, shines lights at a couple of different angles. So you get this kind of three-dimensional embossed kind of look, which is really cool. Um, so you can use light sources in the microscope to adjust the contrast and see things better. But a very common way to in, in, um, enhance contrast for microscopy is simply to stain the cells. So unstained cells have the same refractive index as the glass they're on, but stained cells have a different refractive index. So they're much more obvious, much easier to find. And also we have stains that are designed to tell us, you know, functional things about the cells as well. So staining is a great way to increase contrast. This is just um, a couple of pages from the book table looking at different types of microscopy. I'm not going to get into the other kinds of microscopy because we we would never be able to do it in, in this class. We don't have access to these microscopes. Bright field is essentially what we're doing when we are doing a light microscope. Um, there are dark field microscopes, which just, again, uh, ad adjust the light differently. All right, phase contrast can sometimes be done with compound microscopes, but usually they are larger, more expensive microscopes with more light sources. <clears throat> um, they just allow you to do that cool thing where it kind of looks three-dimensional or embossed. That's what differential interference does. There's also fluorescent microscopes that can shine different lights and of different colors in order to see molecules that fluoresce under that wavelength. And this is used a lot of times with materials when you're trying to identify certain parts of a cell. You can use fluorescent molecules to tag parts of the cell. You get really cool images. Fluorescent microscopy is really cool and fun. Confocal microscopy is like fluorescence microscopy on steroids. It's like confocal and fluorescence microscopy kind of combined. 
um, and you get a lot more detail, a lot higher resolution. These microscopes take up a whole room um, by themselves. Uh, they're very large as are transmission and scanning electron microscopes. So electron microscopes can get real detailed uh, and uh, these are all super expensive and only really found in research institutes and like an institute would have like let's see when i was in grad school um like maybe each maybe one floor you'd have a confocal microscope at most on you know every floor and multiple labs would share one confocal microscope um at my grad school we had one electron microscope i think on the whole campus maybe there were a couple on campus in different departments but they these are very expensive also required like a whole room all right so when we're preparing specimens for microscopy we're putting them on a slide you can look at live um, bacteria or or parasites sort of you can look at live cells on a slide it's called a wet mount where you just basically put a drop of water and then you look at it and you can see microbes moving so wet mounts are fun um, but it's also kind of can be harder to find them if there's not a lot if they're not sitting still they'll swim off screen so most of the time and also you know they're still infectious they're still alive on a hand, hanging drop so most of the time we want to kill bacteria and fix it or stick it to the slide that way we can come back to it um it's not infectious because they're killed so the killed killed bacteria um, fixed onto a slide is much more common we can also of course stain them to make them more visible increase that contrast so a simple stain is one that just stains everything the same color and so a simple stain can be either positive or a negative stain so a positive stain it's called positive because these are positively charged they um, are stains that have a positive charge they're basic and since cell surfaces have a negative charge the positively charged dye sticks to the cell surface and so these will positive stains actually stain the microbe so these pink dark pink things are the microbes right a negative stain has a negative charge and negative repels negative so the cell surface the surface of the cells in this case repel the negatively charged dyes they don't bind and so so in the case of a positive stain you add stain and then you wash off the excess and um, so it's a little bit pink in the background there but what stayed pink what stained pink was the cells themselves with a negative stain you usually just drop a uh, put a drop of stain on the cells and then you don't even have to you don't wash it away you just look at it right under the microscope and wherever there's cells you actually get like a clear zone so the cells are unstained but the background is stained all the glass slide basically is stained so you see the microbes as these clear spaces in a stained background um, so he said simple staining is when you're staining everything one color so you're just using one dye um, a differential stain though is one where you use two or more dyes and depending on the type of cell they'll pick up either one stain or the other so you get a different result depending on the type of cell so the classic differential stain um, is the gram stain so in, when you gram stain bacteria you can either get blue cells blue or violet cells the, we call those gram positive or they could end up looking pink and then we call those gram negative and I'll explain how we do that in another another time so a bunch of different there's lots of different types of differential stains or special stains gram stains this is actually a better image of a gram stain because you can see some gram positive and gram negative cells on the same slide so some of them stained blue and some of them stained pink um, acid fast is a similar type of stain it also results in a pink or blue 
um, result. Endospore staining stains for endospores. So you can see in pink here, these are the pink endospores. Um, capsular staining is a type of negative stain. So this, the little dot in the middle of these circles here, that's the bacterial cell. And the capsule is of just a field of carbohydrates, like just like an afro, basically, around the cell. And so they, you can see the capsule, the size of the capsule here, because it repels that stain. So this, this outline, it does look kind of like, just like a big poofy hairball. And then there's also flagellar staining. So there's special stains that will stick to the flagella and make them more visible. But even so, this is a this is a pretty good image. I've looked at flagellar stains in class before, and you almost you you have to have it on full magnification and you have to squint a little to really be able to make out the flagella because they are very faint. And uh, we're gonna do some of these microscopy labs in actually, no, I'm gonna do one with you right now. And then you'll do. Um, is it not working? Why are you not working? Uh, sounds like my daughter is FaceTiming with a friend. All right, since I can't, oh no, oh no. All right, well, I guess I'm not gonna show it to you now. I'll have to do it in another video. Well, that's the end of chapter two.